Today, uh, I'm going to be bringing a message, standalone message, once off, a message I've entitled, Sowing Against the Odds. Sowing Against the Odds. And really what I want to talk about today is for those of us who may feel like we're in a season where the odds are against us. Ever, ever felt like your back was to the wall? Ever felt under pressure? Like for some of you, your theme song is under pressure, you know, dun, 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 you know. Under pressure. It's like, man, that's, that's my life song right now. I really want to speak to those people who feel as though their season right now is tough. We're, we're, they find themselves living in tough times. And, and tough times are interesting. Why? Because it, we, as, as human beings, we're only ever in three different places as it pertains to tough times. Either we're going into some tough times, either we're in tough times, or we're coming out of tough times. Either way, there's only three geographic, you put it, you open Google Maps, you type in tough times, there's only three pins that will drop. Going in or coming out of, that's it. As human beings, a part of life cycle, ups and downs, wins and losses that we go through tough times. And what, what makes tough times so tough? Well, it's this combination of pressure and tension, pressure and tension. What, what's the difference between pressure and tension? Well, pressure is an external reality. We feel the pressure, the weight, the stress of what's happening around us, the expectation. Uh, we, we, f- we just feel like, like all this, this, this heaviness is on us, whereas tension is something we experience on the inside. It's like an internal pressure. Uh, and for most of us, we can handle pressure on the outside when there's in, no internal tension, right? Or we can handle internal tension when there is a lot of pressure on the outside. But when both those things come together, that's when we find ourselves in tough times where there's pressure and tension. And right now, depending on where you are in life, what you're going through. Maybe that pressure and tension is something you're facing mentally. There's a mental battle. You just can't seem to, to get joy in your life. You can't seem to get a breakthrough. You got this, all this negative thinking. And even though things are working out in so many parts of your life, even though the future is inherently good, still you find yourself struggling to cope mentally. Maybe it's a relational thing. Maybe you find yourself here today. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're, some friends have betrayed trust. Maybe you're, you're coming out of a breakup. Maybe right now you're in a marriage struggling or a marriage that unfortunately has died. Maybe the tension and pressure is relational or maybe it's financial. I mean, with everything skyrocketing in price, like yesterday we were on the way home, we stopped for some milk and little. We bought one, two liters of milk and one oat milk because, you know, you have to have someone in your house doesn't drink normal milk. And it was like 27 euro 50. Not really, it was like six euro or something. But still it's like, man, how did milk get so expensive? Like, are cows now living in palaces? Are they driving Lamborghinis? Like, what the flip is going on that milk is so expensive all of a sudden? Like, I mean, I'm all for equal pay and everything, but for goodness sake, five euro for milk. Like, and all this pressure financially, I think, and again, it's probably true psychologically, that usually what causes so much of our relational, come on, pressure and tension, and usually what can cause a lot of our mental pressure is when we're financially under pressure. Maybe you're here because there's a sense which spiritually 
you find yourself. Maybe you were raised in the Christian faith, but I've kind of lost your way. Or maybe you've never, never embraced Jesus or the Christian message, but you're, but you're open, you're searching, you're, you're asking the question I asked 20 years ago. Surely there must be more to life than this. Well, if you are in any of these categories, or indeed if you're in all of them, you're in the right place there because I believe God wants to speak to, some, speak to us to give us something that will help us and give us hope. Now, when you look at your own life story, your own history, your family history, like we all, we look back, our lives usually are categorized by ups and downs, great times and not so great times. You look at history, look at like the history of Ireland. Ireland has known some tough times. I mean, historically, there's been ups, there's been downs. You think about the recession of 2008, that was a bummer. For those of you old remember the recession of the 80s, that was also a bummer. Perhaps the, the, the greatest historical event that most people go to when they think of tough times in Ireland is the 1840s famine or the hunger, as it's called. And if you've ever been down to the Keys to see this wonderful monument right in front of the Epic Museum, which by the way, if you've never done the Epic Museum, do yourself a favor and go check out that museum. It's really, really cool. But roughly one half of the entire population of Ireland left or died of starvation in a 40-year period. Like Up until now, our country has never regained its populace from the loss of a time. And that, that time of suffering, a time of famine, a time of starvation, and death and emigration left an indelible mark upon us, the Irish people, that has shaped how we are and how we view the world. In fact, most of us will be ex uh, uh, familiar with the expression, the fight in Irish, or seeing logos like this. This is the infamous logo of the American football team, Mo Notre Dame. They'll be playing in Dublin, the Aviva in August. The reason why we're called the fight in Irish isn't because we're always fighting each other, although that's true. A lot of fighting happens in Ireland, you know. Uh, if you're not fighting with someone, you're fighting for someone, which you're always fighting. But actually, the... Uh, the label, the, 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 the saying fight in Irish actually came from the fact that when you look at the story of Ireland, the history of the people here, it's one long story of battles and perseverance. And I won't get into all the historical, political elements of that, but we're called the fight in Irish because despite all the things that oppose us, our spirit is, is one that, that does not give in easily. It's not capitulate easy. There's something about the culture, the story, the narrative of the Irish people that we want to keep on fighting even to the bitter end. And much like the famine of the 1840s, we may, we may feel as if we, as people today, we live in a metaphorical state of famine. Maybe it's, a, it's a, a famine spiritually for certain. When you look out at Ireland right now, spiritually speaking, there's no doubt that Ireland is a place of spiritual famine. There is a deep spiritual hunger in the hearts of men and women in Ireland for truth and ultimately for God. But there's a famine, there's a lack of supply when it comes to people being able to satisfy that hunger spiritually. Maybe you find yourself in a famine relationally, or like I said, mentally, or Spiritually, what, what, what is a medical for, for a famine? It's when we can't meet expectation. It's like, it just seems the bar is so high we can never seem to achieve. Maybe it was something that our parents put on us, an expectation. One day you're going to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't care. You're going, like maybe it's an expectation that was put on you by someone else and you just cannot seem to live up to that expectation. Maybe it's an expectation or you put on yourself of by this point in my life, my career, I'll be here, have this stuff, and be in this place. Maybe something's happened to your health or something's happened to you relationally that's just crippled you emotionally and in some senses set you back to the point where you just are so frustrated because you have the external pressure and the internal tension of those expectations. And ultimately, when we get crippled, what happens when we're crippled? We can't move forward. Isn't it interesting how inconvenient sickness is? You ever notice this? Like, being sick sucks. But one of the things that really frustrates me of being sick is that I can't move in the same pace, in the same way, with the same level of, of uh, tenacity or the same level of, 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 of uh, you know, dynamic force that I like to move with when I'm, not, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm well. Sickness for, it cripples us in a sense 
and caused us to have to stop because we can't move forward. And of course, that leads to a point where we just can't maintain ourselves. We can't maintain the facade that we've thrown the world. We can't maintain uh, the output. We can't maintain the lifestyle. We can't maintain financially. Like whatever it is, when we find ourselves not able to meet, not able to move, and not able to maintain, then in a sense, we find ourselves in a place of desperation. And again, either we're going into, in, or coming out of some place of desperation in us. And I want to say this, if you're here, you're not a Jesus follower, you're not a person of faith, please understand, desperation is not something Christians are unfamiliar with. So much of God's best work actually happens in our most difficult circumstances. And what, what, what's, what's the human response to desperation? Usually there's two types of response. Number one, we run. <laughs> We flee. It's like, man, I can't handle this pressure. I can't deal with this tension. I'm hitting eject. I'm saying, beam me up, Scotty. Like, I'm out of here. I cannot deal any longer with the pressure and tension of the desperation I find myself in. So the first thing we do is run. The second thing we have to do is control. It's like, well, if I can't rely on circumstances, if I can't rely on him or her, if I can't rely on them, well, then I'm going to control my life, myself. I'm going to control as much as I can because whatever I'm in control of, surely it won't let me down. But what happens when you've heard to control, but eventually those who love you leave you because no one likes to be attached to someone who's overly controlling, manipulative, and all that. And eventually you fail yourself because you cannot control your life out of desperation, tension, pressure, and tough times. Because if you're alive, if you're breathing, part of the experience of the human existence is that we struggle. So we find ourselves almost like farmers trying to, trying to live a life that's productive, trying to do things in like sowing seeds that brings a harvest. We have dreams for our, for our future marriage. We have dreams for our career. We have dreams for the business we want to start. We have dreams for our music. We have dreams for our family, dreams for our kids. Like we, we have all these, we have the, in our mind, we can see the field, so to speak, ripe for the harvest as it is now in many parts of our country. But we find ourselves personally in a state of famine. So the question I ask is today is how do we, in times of relational, financial, spiritual, emotional, add in whatever category you want, uh, famine, how do we sow against the odds? Now, as we do every week, we're going to turn to God's word because uh, if you're new here, you know this, that the answer for life, love, and liberty is found in God's word. Uh, This is so important. Why? Because the one constant the one truth, the one thing, no matter what history happens in history of the world, that always remains the same and is a concrete foundation for our lives is God's word. And what's so cool, I think, about God's word in this instance, and maybe you don't know this, maybe you, 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 you were kind of misinformed, is that God's word isn't full of perfect people that live perfect lives, because that's what Christianity is, perfect. The Bible is filled with stories of ordinary people that screwed up massively and regularly and in their failure and in their brokenness and in their famine times, in their relational breakdowns, financial tensions, in their mental breakdowns, like you, no matter where you read, you find all these stories, you see the faithfulness of God at work in people's lives. And so because we can see ourselves in the characters of the Bible, we can also believe that just like God did for them, God can do for us also. So we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 26, and we're going to look at a story uh, from verse 1 to verse 12. I won't read all the verses. You can read them later on, but I will jump around. And this is a story of a guy called Isaac. Anyone ever heard of Isaac? Maybe you have a friend called Isaac. Some of your kids are called Isaac. Isaac was the son of a guy called Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. Now, just to give you some context, Abraham, we're told, God called uh, out of his homeland into a promised land with the view that God would use him to be a blessing to the nations. And what was so ironic in Abraham's story was even though he was blessed and called to be someone who'd have a multitude of children, up until like his 80s, up until like old age, he had no kids. And eventually God said, I am going to give you a son, a son of promise, and he will be the the kind of, uh, what do you call it, a starting point 
to which I'm going to do all these amazing things. Well, we're told that when, Sarah, when Abraham's wife Sarah heard God giving Abraham the promise, she laughed out loud. She LOL. Like, this is crazy. There's no way. It's impossible. And so I, one of the ways you can spell Isaac is rather than going I-S-A-A-C, you can just write down LOL. Because literally, Isaac means he laughed. It's almost like God saying, when you find yourself facing impossible circumstances, and I give you a promise, I will always have the last laugh. Because God's promise is more powerful than the impossibility of our circumstances. That's a whole story you can read later on. But Isaac grew up and became a man in his own right, got married, a wife named Rebecca, and he now faces a test in his lifetime. And what we're going to see here in, in a few seconds is that Isaac found himself just like his father before him, trying to decide who would he be, what would he what values would he hold to and what choices would he make about his life that would help him see the same promises of God in his life as his father? So in Genesis 6, verse 1, the first point I want you to see this is Isaac suffered a great famine. Isaac suffered a great famine. Verse 1, now, there was famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And what's so interesting is like about 70 years before this, because famine is a, tough times are recurring, right? Uh, it's not the same famine as Abraham's saying, but it's just like it. There's a famine in the land. And we're told Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now, if you go back and read Abraham's account, you'll see Abraham also encountered this guy called Abimelech 70 years previous. But Abimelech isn't a name, it's a title. Abimelech means my father is the king. So basically, the king of the Philistines was, was like a, a pharaoh-like figure. And just like Abraham, before Isaac met with the king, so would Isaac. And to give you some kind of like context geographically, here's a little picture. So uh, right here is the Sea of Galilee. That's eventually where Jesus would be with his disciples. Uh, roughly over here uh, would be where, uh, uh, sorry, over here, excuse me, it was where, where Jerusalem would be. And over here in the land of Philistine, you see Gerar. So we're told that the land of Canaan, which Isaac was in, which was supposed to be the land of promise, was going through a time of famine. And Isaac, as we're about to see, was faced with a difficult choice because he realized as an entrepreneur, and again, back in those days, there was no countries as there are now. There were no rights. There was no social services. Isaac basically was a, a nomad. He was a traveling tradesman. He had cattle, he had flock, flocks, uh, and he had his family. Ultimately, if there was no famine, it would mean that he would lose his business, he would lose his livelihood, and maybe lose their lives. So what people often did in times of famine, as they do now, because maybe you didn't, you didn't come from a country that had physical famine, maybe it was a political famine, or maybe it was a, a famine that caught, was characterized by uh, violence, or maybe it was... Uh, employment famine, just like now, what people did historically in times of famine is they would migrate. They would find somewhere that didn't have a famine and would give them better prospects to build a better future. And they would go to those places. Nothing wrong with that. That's how humans survive. So Isaac is about to make this long journey from the land of promise down to Egypt because there was no famine in Egypt. And it says uh, in verse 2, on his way, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, now this is really interesting, why? Because in Isaac's plan, his mind, he was going to Gerar on the way to Egypt. What Isaac intended as a detour, what he meant as a pit stop, what, he, what for him was a, I'm going to get some fuel, I'm going to go to the petrol station, God was going to use as a destination. Because here's the truth, one of the truths we're going to see today. That ultimately, no matter what we go through, what land we find ourselves in, no matter what kind of tough time we're going through, no matter what we're needing or believing for, ultimately the biggest, most significant, greatest need that we ever have, wherever we are, whatever we're going through, is we need an encounter with God. Because one encounter with God changes everything. One encounter with God, even the most difficult of circumstances, changes everything everything. Now, God may not change our position. He may, not just, he may not like literally beam us up, Scotty, or remove us. But oftentimes, as a result of encountering God, God changes our perspective. 
God may not change the things around us to suit us, but God will change something in us. And when we're changed, what happens? We begin to be a change and bring change to the world around us. That's what we want to do as a church. The reason why we're called Lighthouse is because we're not the destination. We're a vehicle that points and reminds people that if you find yourself lost at sea spiritually, if you find yourself drowning under the pressure, if you find yourself unable to swim or make your way back in, there is help and there is hope in Jesus. We want the world around us to know that there is one King, one Lord, one God, with one plan and one purpose, and that any human being, no matter how broken, how sinful, or how lost they may feel, can have a home and a place with God. And we want to be a church that doesn't just gather on Sunday, but we want to be a church that lives out what we're called about Monday through Saturday. So in our brokenness and in our own fa failures, in our fallen nature, people see at work in us the hope and help of the gospel. We want people to know that when, when God changes us, things around us change. Now, of course, that's not what we want, right? We want God to change the other person. Oh, God, change her. Oh, God, change him. Oh, Lord, if you would change my friends, if you would just, like, we're always praying for God to do for others what we know God needs to do in us. Oftentimes, the challenge we're facing, whether it be with a boss or whether it be with a spouse or be with a friend or whatever, isn't this, they're not the problem. They, they need prayer. They're the purpose. <laughs> they're why God put us here to, to serve and be light. What God needs to do, actually, if we're honest, is to change us. And so Isaac's thinking, I'm just going to stop here temporarily. And I think it's so funny because I know for some of you, maybe you've come to Ireland and you thought, I'll just make a temporary stop on the way to somewhere better. <laughs> Some with sunshine. Let me tell you something. Amen. We're all, we're all a temporary stop in Ireland. I mean, I'm sure my ancestors three million years ago made a temporary stop in Ireland on the way to Florida and get stuck here. Like, it's just fascinating to me that so many of you maybe have come here, oh, we'll just go there for five years and do this and da 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 And it's like, well, sometimes what we plan to be a detour, God uses destination. Now, what did God say in this encounter? He said, do not go down to Egypt. Do not run, Isaac. And do not try to take control of your own destiny. Live in the land where I tell you, See, there's a test here. The test is, who is my provider? The test is, who really guarantees the reality of my aspirations, hopes, and dreams? The test here is, who really is God? Is God God or am I God? The test is, who really am I living my life for? Am I living my life for myself, of myself, by myself? Or is there a greater calling on my life to live for someone greater than myself? Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is stay where we are. Sometimes the most, the most powerful thing we can do is not freak out under the pressure and tension and press eject and run or try to control everything so it works so we can be at peace. Sometimes the most powerful demonstration of our faith is we stay in faith, trusting that God will be faithful. Again, sounds easy, but very hard to do when you're faced like Isaac was at a famine. But this is very important because here's the second thing I want you to see. Isaac was a son or was the son of great favor. Now, why was Isaac the son of great favor? Well, because his father, like I said, was Abraham. And God just chose sovereignly by his will to love and bless Abraham because Isaac was Abraham's son. Isaac inherited by virtue of who he was related to, the favor of heaven. Now, fast forward the clock a couple of thousand years when Jesus was on the earth and proclaiming the kingdom of God had come and that anyone with their faith and trust in him would be saved and set free. And his disciples one day said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus said, here's how you should pray if you're a follower of me, my Father, who is in heaven. See, despite the good or bad or indifferent nature that we may have with our earthly fathers, some of us, we don't, you know, that's just a, a don't go there subject. 
Others of us, we wish we had a father we could talk about, we never knew the guy. Others, we had a, a good relationship. I mean, we're all in different places. The point is, no matter how good or bad our absent, our earthly father was or is, when we put our trust in Jesus, we have a heavenly father. We have a home. We have someone we can go to. We have, we have a place to belong. We may feel like, man, I'm so disconnected in this world because I have no place, no family, no central hub. But in the gospel, there is the promise of a home, a spiritual home. And because our father is the father in heaven, we are sons and daughters of favor. I want you to know that when the greatest ways that I can prove this to you to be true, is we know the enemy's a liar, right? His native tongue is lying. If he's speaking, he's lying. Isn't it interesting, right, that one of the things the enemy will do to everyone all the time is tell them you're worthless and you're nobody and nobody. Like, if you're not, if you're not a Jesus follower, like, why is that? Why is that everyone can, can agree with, yes, I often struggle with the same thoughts? It's because those lies are trying to hide a truth. And the truth is this. For as many as become the sons and daughters of God, true Christ Jesus, we are sons and daughters of favor. And just because we're going through difficult times does not take away from our value, our worth. A couple of years ago, I was speaking at a church in Canada, very large church, very well-known church. And one of the guys who was driving me, he was on staff there, and we're chatting, we're talking about family. And I was asking about his children. He said, yeah, I've got this, that, and the other. I said, oh, and where's your son? And he was a bit like slow to kind of tell me more information. I didn't want to press too much, but I was like, okay. I wasn't sure what happened. But eventually he said to me, listen, my son is in prison. He done some really bad crime and whatever, and he's in there for, and it wasn't like in there for five years, like he was in there for like, I don't know, 30 years, I can't remember the exact uh, time frame, but obviously he'd done something very bad. And I was like, man, can you imagine being a parent and having a child in prison? Like how hard that would be. And what's so interesting to me was talking to this father, it's like, even though his son screwed up, and even though his son was now paying the price of the consequences for that screw up, in his mind, his son did not lose any value or worth in his eyes just because he was behind bars. He would always be the son that he loved. And the same is true for us. No matter what we go through, no matter what, no matter, no matter what stupid decisions we make that end us, lead us to being ended up in some kind of prison state, God's love for us is not based on our performance. It's based on who he is. And he is good. This is important. Why? Because when we find in ourselves in tough times, we need to know Two things. Number one, who we are in Christ and whose we are in Christ. Because it's so easy in this world to attach all of our worth and value to what we own, to where we are, to who we know, to who knows us, and to all these material things. And the problem with that is that when those things start to crumble around us, all of a sudden we begin to think, well, I don't have any stuff. I don't have anybody. I don't have anywhere to go. Therefore, I must be a nobody. And again, uh, going back to the, the terrible uh, lockdown period, there was a lot of people that really struggled beyond no the norm in lockdown because so much of who they were was attached to those things. And when you couldn't go anywhere, when there was nothing to post about, when there was no one, no one to hang out with, people literally collapsed. Why? Because so much of who, who we had, had, had built ourselves to be was tied to the things that we own, the place that we go, and the people that we would hang out with. And again, those things aren't bad things. But we need to be reminded in tough times that actually we are more than what we own. Listen to me. You are more than who you know. You are more than what you earn. You are more than the college degree that you earned or the title that you have or the position you have. You are more than anything because in God's eyes, you are a son and daughter of great favor. You are loved and you are blessed and you are favored and you are chosen. We did not choose him, but he chose us. We should be reminded that we have worth, not because of what we do, what we earn, or that we have worth because of whose we are. 
And even though the world may discard you, maybe a spouse or friends or whatever, no matter, what, 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 who, no matter who it is that rejects you, understand. And again, please listen carefully if you're not a Jesus follower. Your Father in heaven, through what Jesus did on the cross, accepts you and loves you and welcomes you home. And more than just allowing us to sit in the room, you know, it's, it's always interesting when you, when you go into uh, environments that aren't your environment. You know, we, we have a, a staff meeting every Monday, which our team gathers from all locations, and we review Sunday, and we pray for all, we go to this, all these prayer requests, pray for every single prayer request. We, we go to all the wins, all the great stuff that God has done, and we review the Sunday. And what's so cool is oftentimes people from our, one of our locations are like, hey, can I come and sit in and watch one of those things, absolutely. And when people come in the door, they'll try to kind of, the first they'll sheepishly stand around going like, do I sit like in the corner? Like, like do I stand? Like, like, where's my place here? And isn't it a wonderful thing when you find yourself out of place, in a place, and someone comes along and says, there's a place for the table. There's a seat for you here. Like, you're, you're, you're not an inconvenience. You belong here. In the same way, there's a place for us at the table in God. And more than just allowing us in, he gives us an extraordinary purpose. We are ordinary people, but we are called to an extraordinary purpose in Christ. Now, what's so funny, as you go back to the story, is Isaac couldn't see, all he could see was that he was under real pressure living with real tension because he was in a position where with one bad move, he could lose his business, lose his marriage, lose his kids, lose, literally lose their lives. It was a real struggle. But on his way to somewhere else, he encountered God and God gave him an instruction. With that instruction came a choice. Do I trust and obey or do I run in control? Here's what God said in verse three. He said, stay. Say stay. Come on louder, Stay. He said, stay in this land for a while. For a while. Here's a great question. How long is a while? You ever notice how different cultures have different allotments of time for different time allotments? For example, in Ireland, we say, I'll be there in five minutes. What does that mean? An hour, five minutes, yeah. It doesn't mean a lot, does it? But you know, in Ireland, there's a difference between five minutes and two minutes. Have you noticed this? Like five minutes, and I don't know what the exact time frame is, it's longer than two minutes. Uh, certain cultures, you know, I'll be there shortly. Well, what does shortly mean? You know, our South Africans, I'll be there just now. But now is now. What do you mean just now? And one of the cool things about living in the multicultural gen generation is like, all the different ways that we express time, because like, well, what time are we gonna be? Uh, around two. What does around mean? Before, is it, is it on the front side of two? At two? After two? Well, if an Irish person is around two, what did it mean? 10 past two. If you say I'll be there in two minutes, it's half past two. If I'll be there in five minutes, it's three o'clock. You ever notice this? Kind of crazy. Now who's right and who's wrong? Well, that's for you to decide. Culture is culture. But time is a funny thing. When God said to Isaac, stay in the land for a while, I think he thought what we all think when we find ourselves struggling and someone says, wait a minute. It's like we go to the ER or a and E's we call it here. Or you go to the dentist. How long would it be? A while. Recently, my son broke his arm and went down to a and E and we were there. And I said, how long is it going to take? Oh, it should be like a few hours. A few hours. 10 hours later. It's crazy. I don't recommend you go to ER. So, but here's the key. Here's the important part. It doesn't matter how long the time actually is. What really matters is the next line. And I will be with you. And I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands. And will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. Now here's the choice. God says, I know it's difficult. I know it's tough. I know it's uncomfortable. I know you want to run. I know, you, I know I, God understands all the emotions that we go through. But I'm asking you to trust me in this. Stay where you are. So verse six, we're told, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now how long is a while? Verse eight. 
when Isaac had been there a long time, so clearly God is Irish, a long time. It wasn't a short while or a wee while, it was a long time. So Isaac is like, man, we're under pressure. We got tension. We got to run. We got to control. We got we to gotta act. And God's like, Isaac, here's the most powerful action step you can take. Stay still. And trust me. Now the power was, I'm not going to write a book and say, okay, the power is staying still. Like the power wasn't in the posture or the position. The power was in the obedience. The power was in the fact that God said do, and Isaac chose to do as he was told. But here's the point. Just because Isaac was a son of great promise doesn't mean he didn't experience pressure. In other words, to have the privilege of being called a son of daughter of God does not equal that we don't experience pressure as Christians. One of the, one of the craziest things in the world is people who promote a gospel says, oh, if you love and follow Jesus, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And they quote verses written by men and women who were killed for their faith. Does that seem ironic to you? Like they'll quote verse the Apostle Paul, like we heard earlier on in Romans, powerful verses, and, and, and they misapply them and say, you know what, yes, you know, no matter what happens, God's not, not going to end them bad happen to you. And then, of course, you, you forget the fact that the person who wrote that verse literally had their head chopped off for the gospel. And, and as sad as that is, what, what should inspire us is that people actually believed the value of what they had in Jesus was so great, it was better than life itself. But just because we're privileged to be called sons and daughters of God does not mean we will not experience pressure. We will. We often talk about this idea of minding the gap. When you go to get a train, and you have that like yellow line that says mind the gap because on the platform, there's safety. The platform isn't moving. If you're at a train station, the platform's moving, either you're on drugs or there's an earthquake. Either way, you're in trouble. The platform doesn't move. It stays stationary. It's solid safe. But between where you are and the vehicle that will take you to where you want to go, there's a gap. And in some train stations, that gap is really short. In other train stations, it's like, re- it's like, it's like a it also a jump on the train. True story. When my mother was eight months pregnant with me, she fell through the gap of the train. She tells me it's why I am the way I am. I don't know about you, but she tells me. So there you go. Very affirming mother I have. I was like, did you jump through the gap? Or, you know, anyway. So, so the gap is no joke. But there is like this little mini step of faith that we have to do every time we step over a gap. Just the other day, I, we were away in Northern Ireland for a few days, and we did this uh, famous rope bridge crossing uh, up near uh, Port Rush. I think it's called Carrick Re or Carrick Re or something. And it's just a rope bridge that connects the mainland to the little island. It's only like, I don't know, 20 meters long. But we got there, it was very windy, and I had to hold my son Jonathan, which you don't know my son Jonathan. He is, when he doesn't want something, he doesn't do something. You know what I'm saying? So if he decides he's not going to be held, he'll just slap you in the head and jump out your arms. Like, I mean, he's just, he's, just, he's just very stubborn. And so I find myself, and I'm not afraid of heights, I find myself on this rope bridge, and the actual, because of use, the actual handles were sagging, so they weren't really solid, like they were like sagging. So I'm holding him, I'm holding a saggy rope. I'm thinking at any point, if he pushes himself off, he could fall to his death. It was very, very upsetting. And I'm walking across the rope bridge, like just trying to hold on to him and the rope for life, just praying that something didn't happen. And when I got off the other side, what I didn't expect to happen was I had so much adrenaline going through my body, not because I was afraid for me, because I was afraid for him. And as we were over there, we got to hang out and rest. The thought dawned on me, now I have to go back. <laughs> it's like, dang, you know, I have to go back to endure this thing again. And I'm trying to think of all the ways. Should I phone a helicopter? Should we swim? Should I, you know, what, what should, could, you know, make him sleep? I don't know. It was crazy. The point is, to get from where we are to where we want to go, oftentimes it requires a step of faith. It's not going to be easy. It requires something in us. For Isaac, it was... Would you trust me enough to stay despite what you see? And you say, well, ah, oh man, like, but we're Christians. We shouldn't have to. Listen to me. What I've learned is, is that the, more, the greater the privilege, the greater the pressure. Like the more God has called you in this life, the more you're going to have to go through for God to shape your character to prepare you for this calling. As I was praying this morning and preparing the message, this, this talk came to mind. I wrote this down and I said, God would not give us 
what will destroy us. In other words, sometimes we ask for things thinking they're the right thing, but God knows they're bad for us. So God won't give us what we ask for because he knows they're bad for us. And ultimately, the greater our calling God is, the greater the, the <laughs> typo, the greater the, the, the greater the test will be to develop the character necessary to carry that calling. I'll say it again. The greater our call is in God, the greater the test will be to develop the character necessary to carry that calling. The more privileged we are as sons and daughters of favor, the more God has called us, the more that God has prepared us to be able to walk in and live out that calling. So Isaac suffered a great famine. Isaac, like us uh, who follow Jesus, was a son and daughter of great favor. So what, was the, what did Isaac actually do then? as we bring this thing to a close in a second. Well, we're told in verse number three, in verse three, that Isaac sowed against the odds, despite the famine, with great faith. Verse 12, it says, it says, then Isaac sowed in that land. He didn't sow in the, he didn't go where the investment was good. He didn't follow the human trends. He didn't follow the stock market. He wasn't on crypto. He didn't, he didn't do something that made logical or rational sense. What he did was he acted in obedience. He sowed good seed in bad soil. He sowed good seed in impossible soil. And we're told that he reaped in the same year 100 fold and the Lord blessed him and the man began to prosper and continuing prospering until he became very prosperous. So clearly the emphasis is on prosperity that this guy, and again, his prosperity wasn't in his controlling, his running, his wisdom, his understanding the financial market, his maneuvering or shaping. His power was in the fact that he chose to trust in God. The word there is referenced three times, prosper, prospering and prosperous, is the Hebrew word gadal. And gadal literally means to grow, to grow and become great. Isaac sowed an ordinary seed in an impossible soil. And because of God's extraordinary power, there was a harvest. See, it wasn't about the power of the soil. It was about the power of God's blessing despite the soil. And we may find ourselves in soil that isn't exactly ideal. Maybe we may be following people on TikTok or following the best thinkers on YouTube or watching our favorite consultant or speaker or thinker or influencer, and they're saying all the reasons why we should get out of this marriage and leave this church and move this country. And, da, 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 da. and God is saying, if you would just stay and trust me, I will pour out my blessing. And against all the odds, even though it seems impossible, you will reap. Harvest. Here's the point. Favor requires obedience. Favor requires obedience. If we want to walk in the favor of God, our power, our, our superpower as Christians isn't in our intellect, or our gifting, or our talent, or our, our, our net worth. Our power is that we are obedient. And God loves to bless those who are obedient. And sometimes we find ourselves, like Isaac, in a place of difficulty where it's like, well, I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand why you're asking me to do this. I don't understand why you're causing me to go through it. I don't know why you're doing it. I don't fully understand why. But listen, where there is a gap between our understanding and God's call to obedience, listen carefully, understanding can wait, but obedience cannot. Our lack of understanding, that can catch up eventually. There'll be a moment where you go, oh, now I see why. Now I understand why. The other day I was reading an article off, off the back of this uh, population survey they did. And, you know, the fastest growing towns in Ireland are like Navin, Dundalk, Drogheda, Swords. You know, basically the region that we have churches in is now the fastest growing part of Ireland. And I'm going, well, that's very helpful, is it, to have a church in those places? But 15 years ago... When God said, uproot your life and move to Navin, I had never been to Navin. And the reason why they had been to Navin is because if I'd been to Navin before God called to Navin, I would never have gone to Navin. Some of you feel that way about Ireland. Like, well, now that I know, I would never have come. It's like one person said they were praying one time and felt like God was calling to an island. They said, oh, Lord, I'll go to any island. And they never realized they should have specified like the Bahamas. You know what I'm saying? Because God said, go to Ireland. 
Like, yeah, now, now it's great to see, oh, okay, now I see what God is doing. Like, we have a church in Navin, one in Dublin, one in Dock, who knows where's next. But the place that we are in is the fastest growing part of our nation. How exciting is that? I didn't think that up. I didn't plan that. That's not on me. I was just obedient when God said go. And I'd like to tell you there was more clarity. I would like to tell you that we started this church with like a five-year plan and strategy and structure and we had team and da, da, da. listen, we did not have a clue what we were doing. And if I'm very honest, we still don't have a clue what we're doing. But where is a lack of understanding? We just choose day by day to be obedient. People often ask me, and I'm not often, but like if I'm in conferences or stuff, like, so what, like, how, how, did, how did the house work? I was like, listen, all I can say is this, whenever God said go, we said yes. That's it. There's no secret sauce. There's no, it's like the power, our truest power as Christians is that we are obedient. And what's at stake here is that there's a difference between a God-factored dream and a manufactured dream. A manufactured dream is a future and a calling you build by yourself, of yourself, for yourself. And it may look great on Instagram reels, but really it's misery. It's cheap, doesn't last, and before you know it, you're forgotten. But a God-factored dream, living out your extraordinary purpose, giving your life to a higher cause, sowing your life for the gospel, and leaving a generational impact that lasts for all eternity, that's a much better dream. I want to encourage you today, church, as we begin to close, that God loves you. And you may feel like, man, I'm in this difficult time and am I being punished? Has God forgotten me? Has God lost me? This is me. God loves you. You are the object of God's love. Isn't that a wonderful sentence? You are the ob- He loves you. He loved you before you knew you. <laughs> he loved you, we're told, from the beginning of time. God decided before you were born, he loves you. It's like when, for those who are parents, when you meet your child after they're born for the very first time, it's this weird mixture of, I've just met you, but I've always known you. Like, like this is the first time I'm holding you, but something in me always loved you. What is that? That is the heart of the father. Before you were, I love you. And, my, and so what's so interesting is that when it comes to kids, kids don't have to earn or work for, they will, they're just loved because they're your children. It's not something they do. You make that choice. Now, later on, as they become like gremlins and push and test and, you know, you just keep reminding yourself, no, 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 I love them. I love them. I love them. Don't kill them. I love them. I love them. I love them. You know, I was like, I have to tell people, grandchildren are a reward for parents who don't kill their kids. Just saying. So, you know, we are, but also we are the instrument of God's blessing. So God's love flows to us, but must flow through us into the world. And when, like Isaac, we are fruitful, where, 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 when we are fruitful, we see God's faithfulness. And God has called you, right, whatever season you're going through right now, to sow seeds of faith against the odds that you face. A wonderful story, wonderful story by a, a preacher called Angus Buchan. He's a South African uh, farmer who, had a, who has an amazing evangelistic ministry. And uh, he told us a wonderful story years ago, and I often quote it, of two farmers. There were two farmers who desperately needed rain because they were in a time of great famine. Both men prayed and said, God, please send me rain. One man got up, plowed the field, and sowed the seed. The other man did nothing. The question is, to which farmer did God send the rain? To the farmer that got up and plowed his field, or to the farmer that did nothing? (laughs) And the answer is, to both of them. But only one reaped a harvest. Why? Because it's one thing to pray in faith. But it's another thing to act in faith. And God has called us in difficult times. But it makes no sense to get up and plow the field and sow seed. In tough times, we can sow seeds. Sow seeds of love in service by faith. Faith in action equals seed in the ground. I want to encourage the church that we can be a people that sow against the odds. 
That maybe right now in your marriage, it's not where you want it to be. Rather than complaining and pressing eject or trying to control, why not sow seeds of generosity? Why not sow seeds of service? Why not sow seeds of kind and uplifting words? Why, why do you expect to reap a harvest in a place you've not sown seed? Maybe it's in work. Maybe you've gotten to the negative culture, the place you work, and you find yourself you're entrenched and battled, and, and you find yourself playing the game. Why not, why not reshape the game and speak about your employer with honor and respect? Why not begin to sow seeds that right now seem nonsensical, stupid even, foolish, but you know by faith will lead to a harvest? Why not in your own spirituality sow seeds in your relationship with God that one day will grow into mighty oaks that will help root, ground, and shape your future family? Why not sow seeds in your kids? Because if you're not, someone else is. And if you're not sowing good seed and telling to their little hearts, the world will steal it from you. In our country, that's so crazy. Why not sow seeds of love? That love isn't that we compromise to suit the national agenda. Love is we love people even though they don't believe what we believe, but we don't change what we believe to suit those that we love. My question to you is, is what is God saying to you right now? I know for me and my wife, over the last few months, most of you are aware of us going through this whole thing of losing our house, had to hand over the keys a few weeks ago, and as I'm telling everybody, like it's, it's one thing to move from somewhere to somewhere, that's hard. But to move from somewhere to nowhere, that's so much harder. I do not recommend that at all. I'm going to watch your whole life be packed up and put away in storage. And to find yourself having to split up your family with relatives because none, your, your family is so big you don't fit in one place. That's tough. To be in a situation where because our car broke down, you don't fit in one car. It's tough. And the whole way through all this, I'm working through Exodus, I'm soaping, reading my Bible, and I'm reading over and over and over again of how the Israelites kept missing the point. It wasn't about where they were, or where they were going, or where they come from. It was about whose they were. And that even in the wilderness of the desert, because they had God's presence, everything they needed. Sometimes we go through tough times because God wants to build in us the character we need to take hold of the calling. What is a tough time you're going through right now? What is, what is God saying to you? Because God will be faithful. Just last night we got keys to a place, moving into this week. God made a way. Thank God. Thank you all for praying for us. Yeah, it's amazing. But the testimony isn't the house. Testimony is the goodness of God in between. What is God saying to you? What is, what is that step of obedience that may, seems nonsensical, irrational, that God's calling you to now? Because our greatest power isn't our gifting, our talent, our influence, our wealth, our worth what we own, earn, what we owe, what we uh, own, or what we, who we know. Our greatest power is that we are sons and daughters of favor. And we pray, we don't say, oh God, if you're out there. We say, my father, thank you that I have a place at your table. Thank you that even though I'm ordinary and broken, that you've called me to extraordinary purpose. Thank you that even though I don't fully understand right now why you're doing what you're doing, I've come to understand that that can wait, but obedience cannot. Where is God asking you to sow seed of faith? You know, as we plant our churches in this country, we're sowing seed of faith in a spiritual famine. We're saying, yeah, it may seem like when it comes to church and the gospel, Ireland is done, but we are going to be like Isaac. We're going to stay in the land for a while. After a long time, we will see a harvest in this nation. Because despite all the odds and all the difficulty, and I remember years ago people say, you know, you're crazy to plant a church in Dublin. I remember even before I, people would say to us, oh, there's no way there'll ever be a church over 100 people in Navan. No way, not in Ireland. Never, never going to happen, ever. Dundalk, are you crazy? Have you ever been to Dundalk? 
God is faithful. He builds his church. We just simply sow seeds of obedience and God gets all the glory. What is God asking you to do? Because I think the most trans, maybe today was a detour. Like you were on, you were, you came here on your way to somewhere else. Like today was like, oh, I gotta go to church, but actually my plans are, and God is saying, no, no, no. What was your detour is my destination. Because God wants us to step off the platform and cross that gap and get onto the vehicle that will carry us forward in our calling. That can only be possible as we encounter him. The band are going to come in a moment. They're going to sing, How I Need You. And I want this to be more than just a song. I want it to be a prayer. I want you to think about, Lord, here's what I'm going through. It'll be relationally, mentally, financially, spiritually. Add in any alleys you want to add in. And I need you today. I need you like Isaac need you, needed you. And here's my, my confidence. That if we are open to obey, God will pour out his favor. And he will prove himself faithful in our lives. Amen. What comes next?